Where are you from? Okay, uh, I am currently located in Alabama where I work remotely. I've been doing this for about eight years. I'm an open source developer. I'm currently employed by a company called Likewise that I joined to, actually Likewise Software, I joined to um, do open source development specifically to uh, do SAMA development for, for them, which I've been doing for about 10 years with various companies and HP before this one, a company called VA Linux before that, so wow. I've been around for a while. Um, where did you go to school? Where did you study? So I went to school actually very close to where I am now. It's called mm -hmm. Auburn University. Um, I still have a lot of friends there. Because I work at home, I still sort of show up in my old office and, uh, okay. and hang out with some of my friends there. Interesting, uh, Mark Spencer, who's the guy that started Asterix and I, went to school both at Auburn during the same time frame. We were classmates together, a couple of years apart. Wow, fantastic. Um, and you studied computer science? Yep, I did my undergrad and my master's work at Auburn and then most of a PhD and decided I couldn't stick it out, so I walked away from it to okay. go to, uh, to industry. Uh, everything but thesis? Yeah, everything but the dissertation, dissertation, which you think, ironically enough, would be very easy to do, considering, you know, once you write three or four books, how hard can a paper be, right? So. And what, were the, what are the difficulties? Just um, I, think for, I think the difficulties are once you leave the academic environment um, and you don't have the sort of daily surroundings of uh, encouraging you to do the research and coming up with a topic and and sort of finishing it out, it just, uh, at some point, it just didn't seem like it was going to, uh, to lead me down the path that I wanted to go. And so. So you wrote a book on Samba. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I've done a couple of books on Samba. I was the, edition, I was the writer on the third edition of this book. Um, and then I've done some for some other publishers that are now sort of out of print. And so for those that don't know, what, what is Samba? Okay, Samba is a suite of software that um, both client and server side that basically makes Unix servers, Linux servers, um, Mac OS X servers uh, look like Windows file and print servers when you look at them across the network. So it's sort of the, uh, the eye candy to make Windows uh, Unix look like Windows. Um, so things like being able to store files uh, on a Unix server and then access those from Windows Vista, Windows XP, uh, Mac OS X clients, uh, things like being able to send print jobs from your Windows clients to your print servers uh, running on Unix or, or OS X. Um, and then also on the, the <coughs> other side of the fence, being able to access, for example, files that are stored on Windows boxes uh, using the native file sharing protocols that Windows uses, you can actually have some command line utilities or, or file systems that allow you to be able to, hmm. to back up or to copy or to read those files from your Unix Does clients Samba as well. Does Samba come bundled in certain installations? Like yeah, Ubuntu yeah. Or? so Samba is included in every major Linux distro. In fact, every Linux distro at this point, and then with a large number of uh, <laughs> commercial Unixes as well. For example, Apple includes Samba as their um, file and print server for SIFS, which is the, the protocol that it implements on Apple. And uh, a lot of other companies, including Sun, HP, ship Samba as well for their solution to make their boxes file and print servers to, uh, existing in Windows networks. Okay. Um, so uh, that, that's interesting. So can you talk a little bit about the Active Directory integration sure. with Samba? So um, in 2003, Samba introduced uh, the first means of integrating uh, file and print servers into Active Directory running on Unix boxes. That was about five years ago. And at this point, there's been a large push for uh, Linux desktops as well. One of the current projects that I have going on now, the company that I work for, um, Likewise Software, has spent uh, a lot of time working with the Samba community to make, that, uh, to make that technology very easily accessible. So for example, in the latest version of Ubuntu, um, Hardy Heron, which came out uh, in April of this year, there's a, a package called Likewise Open, which is based on Winbind, which is part of Samba, that's used to give you very simple, sort of one-step means of joining those Ubuntu boxes into Active Directory. A lot of people have found it to be very useful, and uh, it does all the, the sort of system setup that you would normally have done in the past by hand, so that once you join the machine to Active Directory, then you can log in using your domain credentials, um, and, uh, and, and all your, your groups show up, all of the, the normal things that you would expect when logging into a Windows box would be available as well. And so making that technology available in sort of a, an easily accessible product has been sort of one of the, wow. the real interesting things that I've been working on for the past year or so. So is there, a, what is the latest release of Samba? So just um, this past month, actually, I believe on July the 1st, we released um, Samba 3.2.0 which represents a, a large number of transitions within the Samba project itself. One is we have uh, introduced a new release manager, Carolyn Seeger, who works for Sarenet, has taken over the release processes from me. I worked on those for about five or six years, 
and uh, she's done a tremendous job on this. Samba 3.2 is the first major release upgrade that we've done sort of in, in uh, several years. We've been sort of sliding in a lot of new code and, uh, and, and doing a lot of development work and, and some of the features that showed up in this release are in the authentication portion, or the authentication side, some of the stuff that I did were support for um, cross-force transitive trust when you have a lot of uh, active directory forests that are in place. We support one-way and two-way trusts uh, in those environments now. We also have in the um, configuration management space, uh, some of the other developers, Michael Adam has actually done a lot of work to um, do dynamic configuration by enabling a registry configuration backend, which is, is sort of one of those controversial topics, but I think it's a great move. Um, it means that all of the management applications that you can bring up on a Windows box to be able to do things like create file services on a remote Windows server, it's now much easier to do the same thing when connecting against a remote Samba server. And then that information is actually stored in a database rather than a, a flat configuration file like we've used for in the past. And so it's a much easier, it's, it's an internal change that a lot of users won't actually see, but as developers it gives us a way to programmatically be able to, to touch a lot of different parameters that were very difficult for us to be able to get to. So all of the check boxes that show up in the, the Windows management tools, we can now find a way to sort of plug those in directly to a, a configuration option oh. in Samba itself. So it's a much more um, dynamic way of being able to create file shares on the, on the fly as, as the system is running itself. Um, we're doing some more things, I think, with some of the printer management and, uh, and, nice. and things like that. So it's, oh. and there's a lot of internal file sharing um, changes that have gone on. There's a lot of clustering support, which people have really asked for in the past. Uh, Andrew Trigil has done a lot of work at IBM on uh, something called uh, clustered TDB, which is the database that we use for storing a lot of, of state information. That work is ongoing, but it's very, very promising in the, uh, the scalability of being able to do clustered file servers that sure. have uh, bandwidth and throughput that just seem to, to so scale like literally. cloud computing, for instance. It's not so much cloud computing as no. much as it is in the fact that people have uh, a large disk storage. They have a large SAN or NAS on the, on the network, and they don't want to have a single point of failure so that when clients are connecting through that server, if that server goes down, all of a sudden none of the storage is available. So what they want to do is they want to have you know, large numbers of nodes in a cluster through which clients can connect and still be able to access that storage. So if one of the nodes in the cluster goes down, then they still are able to get to the storage. So not only does this um, handle fault tolerance and help prevent single points of failure, but it also means that the bandwidth that clients are able to access to get to the storage is actually much greater because it's not a bottleneck of one particular machine anymore. So you can have multiple machines that have you know, giggy interfaces and, and the throughput to, uh, to get to the, the disk on the back end is wow. actually much higher. The more nodes that you add in, the more clients that you can add, and then the, uh, the throughput, the overall throughput of the system itself just you know, continues to scale. Um, do you talk, do you discuss the, that topic in the book? So, so the, clustered, <clears throat> the clustered support that we have in Samba is still ongoing under development. It's something that came out um, post when the book was actually published. Okay. A lot of the things though that, uh, that that I've been working on in the past year are covered in the book. The Active Directory integration okay. is covered in the book. Um, that's just continued to, uh, to be enhanced and sort of fixed and promoted as things have gone on. Um, we've tried to be very, very careful in, in Samba in backwards compatibility. So even though the 3.2 release came out previously in this year, um, the configurations, the goal of the Samba developers is that configurations that existed in prior releases, for example, 3.0, which is, is really what the book is, is focused on covering, that all of those configurations are generally forward compatible with the new releases as well. So everything that's covered in the book is, is applicable to the new releases as they come out. There'll be new features that will be introduced. But you know, as always, if the, something changes, a parameter's removed or something like that, we document those in, in the release notes. So it's always important to, to make sure that sure. you you know, are aware of what changes have, have gone on uh, with the new release. So in your opinion, what is, who is the audience for your book? Is this... so, so the audience that, that I, and this is something that I've always sort of tend to focus on, is the systems administration crowd. Um, and, and the reason is, is because I spent many years as a systems administrator. I spent a lot of times at systems administration conference like the USENIX LISA conference that uh, comes up towards the end of the year. Um, I think that systems Systems administration is really sort of the same area of the brain as software development. You're, you're basically taking pieces of the puzzle and putting them together to create a complete system. You're just working at a higher level of the stack. And so, you know, in some ways, I think that um, software developers 
have a moral obligation to document the software that they write uh, or that they work on to help administrators be able to deploy because without systems administrators deploying our software we really don't have a lot of point in doing what we do sure yeah, so yeah um, okay uh, so what sort of projects are you working on now <clears throat> So at the current point in time, uh, I think I've already mentioned I'm working for a company called Likewise, and we're doing a lot of uh, identity management, uh, domain integration. There's a lot of real fascinating things that are going on, all sort of still around the same space that Samba has dominated for years. I mean, Samba has really been the interoperability glue for systems administrators that have Unix, Mac OS X, Linux, and Windows boxes all in the same network. Yeah, yeah. So it's a really interesting problem space. It's more of a distributed um, protocols problem space. And so the work that I've been doing in the past year has dealt with um, making it easier to deploy Linux boxes into these Active Directory, these sort of, you know, corporate environments where people just need to be able to join the machine to the domain uh -huh. um, and then be able to log in using their domain credentials. And, and this has become such a big issue for companies because of um, uh, accreditation, um, certification, SOX, PCI, things like that. And so we find a lot of people that want to deploy Linux. And, and to me, Samba is really an enabling technology for being able to get more open source platforms into those environments because it contains all the technology that people need to be able to, to glue these systems together. Oh. So um, the Active Directory integration, the, the Linux desktop movement, I've been really sort of involved in that in the identity management space. And then we're also um, providing a lot of open source projects of our own within Likewise that relate to the Samba space. We're um, providing a, an additional DC RPC runtime environment for application developers okay. that want to be able to connect to um, a lot of these Windows services, the event log, service control, um, so, um, things like that. What, what RPC API are you specifically what are you targeting is it for Samba APIs well Samba? so the way that distributed systems are built in Windows is there is the underlying network stack itself on top of that is the distributed computing environment remote procedure call runtime the DC RPC runtime on top of that application writers for example the people that wrote event log for Windows the people that wrote the print spooler the people that wrote the the um, remote file service management um, the DFS referral management, all of these sit on top of DCRPC, so it's really a plumbing technology. But without the plumbing in place, none of the applications, which are really more of what the end users see, the porcelain, really doesn't make any sense. And so when you, when you start writing applications at a higher level, you don't want to have to worry about the plumbing, you just want it to be able to work. If you're writing a web application and you go, well, I have a user, I just need to be, be able to authenticate that user, but what I really care about is making sure that that user is able to access information that only they should see. You shouldn't have to understand all the details of authenticating that user because the plumbing should already be in place, you should just sure. be able to leverage off of it. So a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past you know, 12 to 24 months has been plumbing. It's stuff that people don't see yeah. but complain about when it doesn't work. So we're trying to enable application writers to be able to do the type of application integration in these mixed environments without having to become domain experts in things like Kerberos sure. and LDAP yeah, yeah. and NTLM and all these other authentication so and, and service to directory people protocols. At the higher level of the yeah, exactly. spectrum in terms of it, exactly. We're trying to enable people to really do the things that matter because it, open source done right should commoditize technologies at the lower level. They should be available for free. So for example, you know, authentication, there's, there's a lot of commercial applications that provide this integrated authentication with Active Directory and a lot of open source. But, but really making that available for everybody has been what we have, have decided to do it likewise. When we open sourced a lot of the work that we did, the systems management tools, and then the work obviously that we did in Winbind got pushed upstream into Samba. And making that available for everybody means that now vendors are able to, to climb higher up in the stack and do things that, that are really what their core competency is. So it's an enabling technology that we're really trying to, to make for people to be able to, to do what they really There's care about doing. There's a lot of doing. talk now about single sign-ons for a lot yeah. of institutions. Yeah, and it's, it's, such, it's such an overused phrase because yeah. Single sign-on in the truest sense of the word is really Kerberos. It's really presenting your credentials once and never having to present your credentials again. Yeah. And, and that's sort of the holy grail of, of systems administration, right? People don't want to have to remember multiple passwords or things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and for most people, single password is really good enough. So for example, on Linux, it provides an application framework called PAM, the Pluggable Authentication Modules, that allow you to be able to um, 
write a library that then goes in the stack that can do whatever's necessary to authenticate that user. So for example, if you have an IMAP server and people want to be able to check their mail, but they want to be able to use their domain credentials, then they can put in their, their Active Directory username and password. They can authenticate against Curry or IMAP or Cyrus or whatever they want. And that PAM module then can communicate with Winbind, which is part of Samba and, and, and also what we're shipping in Likewise Open. And that allows them to use their domain credentials to check their email running on a Unix server. Now, if they're trying to log in via SSH or they're trying to um, you know, log into a web application, it can go through this same framework. So it's almost a, a choke point to be able to make sure that everybody that logs in uses the same username and password and, and they don't have to remember, oh, well, I'm, I'm logging in this system, I have this username, and, and what it's an application much easier. developer wants is a single library. Exactly, call they just want to say, authenticate this deal user. With all that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's really, uh, you know, I think in order to get desktop Linux and, and to get more Linux server deployments, we have to make it easier for these people wow. to be able to integrate in those environments. I mean, some of the percentage numbers are that Active Directory is basically 90 95% of the directory service market. Okay. Now, whether you can take any of that market, market away is sort of an entirely different discussion, but 75% sure, yeah. of servers deployed are running file print or web services. So Just those should, them, you know. they should go in, they should be a drop-in replacement for mm -hmm. you know, Windows running you know, their native file and print servers and IIS, you should be able to drop it in and users should just not even notice the difference and it should be easy for systems administrators to do without having to understand you know, all the bits that show up on the wire. So making it easier for them to deploy these servers is really one of the main goals that I've had over the, the past several years. Wow, well that, that sounds fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, and it's been a pleasure. Great, thanks.